Um, Muriel Bruckner. She is a graduate student at Utrecht University in the Netherlands. She was a runner up in our uh, uh, student modeler competition, meaning she had a great submission. And um, that gets judged both in the sense of the uh, scientific contribution that the students are making as well as their um, data and um, um, code and software development. Her particular topic is the effects of ecology on morphological development of estuaries. Um, so it's very appropriate to the theme of this year's CSDMS meeting. She's also interested in uh, these predictions of morphological uh, change on long time scale, but looks at the relevance for like eco engineering and management. Uh, today she will talk about um, the modeling, modeling the effect of dynamic salt marsh and micro phytobenthus growth on the large scale morphology of estuaries. Thank you, Mariel. You can take it away from here. Great. Thanks, Irina, for the nice introduction. Hello to everyone from Europe. Um, I'm Muriel, and as you can already see in my title, today I don't want of time, unfortunately, to talk about microfitobentous growth modeling, but um, I didn't strike it, strike it out because we didn't do it, but um, just because of the time issues. So if you're interested in this, don't hesitate to contact me after the presentation. And the background of my PhD and also this presentation is that we would like to understand how morphologies of estuaries form and what constrain them. And they are obviously not only driven by the boundary conditions and uh, constraints by geology or human impact, but there are also a lot of like species living into in the estuary that uh, affect the morphological development. And this is precisely the topic of my PhD. Um, so we call these species eco-engineering species because they live on top of the sediment or within the sediment and uh, determine the erod erodibility. And today I will be focusing on the salt marshes, so on the biostabilizing species. And there are obviously a bunch of different species that can be uh, called biostabilizers. Um, so there's not only salt marshes, but there are also biofilms or, for example, mussel beds. And yesterday we also heard a great presentation about seagrasses. But you can think about many other species that live in the soil and can affect sediment erodibility. But salt marsh presentation is specifically interesting because it directly affects the flow and uh, leads to a deceleration of the flow velocities, which leads to a sedimentation in the vegetation patch. Um, but what is the most interesting part about this, I think, is um, that, uh, that the vegetation is also affected by the sedimentation. But um, to account for this uh, roughness of the vegetation on the flow, we uh, can account for a roughness coefficient C and for a drag force F. And these two parameters are defined largely by the vari variables of the vegetation. So how tall is the vegetation? Uh, does the vegetation have leaves and how dense does vegetation grow? So the effect of vegetation is very much determined by the type of vegetation growing and also the seasonal cycle of vegetation. So and as I already mentioned, if we account for the eco-engineering effects, we also need to know how does the vegetation react to the changes that it applies to its environment, because it will obviously not grow when flow velocities become too high or inundation periods change. So in order to understand the effect of vegetation on estuaries, we need to capture this feedback loop between the eco-engineering effects on the species on the one hand and the vegetation response. That's why uh, we developed this ecomorphodynamic model that on one hand um, is a hydromorphodynamic model parameterized in DALF 3D, which is a pretty sophisticated um, software package that we uh, use a lot in the Netherlands. Um, and this model is coupled to a, a dynamic vegetation code uh, in MATLAB that um, accounts for establishment of vegetation growth and mortality. And these two models are coupled in a way that they interact on a bi-weekly basis. So um, the hydrodynamics that are computed in the dust 3 d model will determine where vegetation can establish and it will also determine if vegetation can survive. So if the flow velocities or the inundation period become too high, then it will kill off the vegetation. 
And on the other hand, the vegetation will also grow. So because of the growth and the mortality, the drag force and hydraulic roughness on the hydrodermorphodynamics will change. And this will lead to this feedback loop between the hydromorphodynamic computations and the dynamic vegetation model. So this is not the first model that includes this feedback loop between species and hydromorphodynamics, but what makes this model a bit more special is that it's um, based on literature, which means that the vegetation parameters are determined by values from experimental studies or fieldwork studies. So we do not, we do not um, prescribe vegetation or calibrate vegetation to a system, but we turn on the system and let the vegetation develop based on the hydromorphodynamic feedback of the model. Um, especially, um, we also um, account for aging of vegetation by several life stages. So if the vegetation grows out of the seedling stage, it will become more resilient to stresses and it will also become larger in, uh, in plant sizes, which will affect the drag force and the roughness again. And in this model, we can combine several species. This is not only restricted to several salt mass species, but also, as you might have thought, microphytobendoc species and also a bunch of others. And we already showed in our, my first publication of my PhD that the salt mass patterns that evolve from this model are pretty well representing realistic salt mass establishment. But obviously there's not only the biostabilizers that stabilize the sediment, but there's also mud. And this is a nice picture from the Netherlands in case you would like to visit. Um, to be fair, the weather is much better now. Um, but when mud settles in a system, it can create this cohesive cover that significantly reduces erodibility of the sediment. And uh, the same as salt marsh vegetation kind of sticks the sediment together in place. And the interesting part about combining mud and salt marsh is that the mud settling is of course enhanced when there's salt marsh present, but there's also the possibility that increasing mud will enhance salt marsh establishment. So when we look at a specific site, we don't really know, will we have a mud flat or a salt marsh? And this will lead to my research question that I would like to discuss with you today. What does establish first in a system? Do we first get salt marsh establishment or does first mud establish and then the salt marsh? In order to investigate this question, we take the Western Skeld estuary as an example. This is an estuary in the Netherlands and um, it's characterized as being very dynamic and a, a mostly sandy estuary, so there's not uh, a lot of mud in the system and it's heavily dredged and occupied by humans because of the, the bunch of ports that are established along the estuary. And the other good thing about the estuary is because of the ports it has been studied really well so there's a lot of data and information available so there exists a calibrated hydrodynamic model of this estuary in DOF3D so this is ideal to use to apply my vegetation model to. And um, this is the DM of the Western Skelt, and you can already see that there are quite some tidal shoals that uh, can be found in the estuary. And we picked one of them, which is the tidal shoal of Weizorden, because it's um, quite interesting to study, because on the right side, you see panels with uh, salt marsh and mud pattern across time. And you can observe that the salt marsh establishment took place in the recent dec decades and has been increasing since and there's also some mud observed on the bar. So in order to tackle our research question, we ran a bunch of scenarios uh, and compared them to see, to actually answer our research question. And uh, we first start with a reference scenario without any vegetation to see if there is mud settling on the tidal show without vegetation present. We have a generic salt mass species parameterized that we run in a model with only sand. And then we have a model run where we add the mud to see how important the mud is for the generic salt mass species to establish. And as the last scenario, we have a mud dependent salt mass species that can only grow in sediment that has a certain amount of mud in the top layer, um, because that's characteristic for some salt mass species that we can find on tidal shoals. And here are already the results. 
So um, on the left panel, you see the mapping as uh, showed in the previous slide. Um, uh, the dark green colors is the dense vegetation and the light green colors is the uh, sparse vegetation. And then the first two columns are the generic species run. One is with only sand and the second one is with sand and mud. Uh, so three uh, different years. And you can see that there is not a very big difference between the patterns evolving from only sand and sand and mud in the system, uh, which is interesting because it shows that the mud is not very important for the species to establish on the tidal bar. However, if we look at the mud dependent species, we see a different pattern. So we have a slight establishment that gradually increases with time and um, so that the vegetation is still able to establish even though it requires mud in the, in the uh, soil for establishment. We compare the corresponding mud pattern. We again see the ecotope maps on the left-hand side. And the first column is the reference run. So the results of the reference run for the mud in the top layer, the darker the color is the more mud. And uh, there's already quite some mud settling on the bar without any vegetation present, especially on the southern tip of the bar. So there is mud establishment at under certain conditions on the bar. If we look at the two vegetation scenarios, then we see that there is enhanced mud uh, on the bar because uh, there's a lot of mud settling within the vegetation patches. And this pattern is much larger for the generic species than for the mud dependent species on the right because the coverage is much larger. But interestingly, even uh, with a species that requires mud to settle, uh, we see more mud uh, in a, in a, on, on the bar after 12 years of simulation time compared with the reference run, showing that the different strategies for salt marsh establishment can promote also different mud coverage and will enhance mud coverage on the bar. So to conclude and come back to my research question, we saw that depending on the, on the species, vegetation can promote mud accretion in places where no mud can settle because the conditions are too dynamic. So in these locations, we first require salt marsh establishment and then we get mud settling. But there are also other parts on the bar that are calmer and where mud settling can also occur prior to vegetation establishment. And we saw that the vegetation establishment is partly determined by the sediment in the bed, meaning that there has to be some mud to make some vegetation types establish and that will alter both the vegetation pattern and the mud pattern. But I've been promising that I will talk about large scale because this was the title show. So we applied our model to the entire Western scale to see if these concepts uh, also apply to the large scale with a larger grid as well. So in the top panel you see the generic salt marsh cover and on the, on the bottom panel the mud dependent salt marsh cover and we see similar trends with vegetation establishing in similar locations for both species types but if you look closely at the cover you see that the generic species has a bit more abundant than the mud dependent species similar to the observations on the tidal show. And if we look to the corresponding top mud in the, in the Western Scout, we also observe the, the same locations of mud, but the pattern is a bit uh, different. And to quantify this effect, I compared uh, in a bar plot the mean mud area for both of the species types to a reference run. So the blue and the red bar are the increase in mud area with vegetation present. And I thought it was interesting to look at thin and, mud, and thick mud layers, which are divided uh, or separated by a, a thickness of 10 centimeters, because thin layers are usually considered to being seasonal and important for eco ecology, while the thick layers uh, are thought to be uh, more morphologically important. And um, of course, the overall mud extent uh, increases with vegetation present, but interestingly, for the generic species type, we have um, um, a larger abundance of the thick mud layers compared to the mud dependent species, while the mud dependent species can promote more thin layer extent because of this gradual expansion. So we can add an additional conclusion point to my slide that uh, 
Also on the large scale, the mud area is enhanced when vegetation is present, present and the, um, the way of um, increase of mud uh, is mediated by, the, mediated by the species type. So thank you very much for your attention and I'm happy to hear about any questions. Thank you very much for an interesting talk, Muriel. Um, we'll give um, people uh, a, a few seconds, typing seconds, um, to um, um, type in their questions. Andrew asked a question. He says, excellent talk, Muriel. In terms of ecosystem feedbacks, have you considered the role of extracellular polymeric substances, EPSs, in stabilizing mud flats? Yes, so that was precisely the topic that I left out with the microphytobenthic species. Um, so we have uh, model runs where we include microphytobenthos, where we specifically change the critical batch stress for mud if, um, if microphytobenthos is present and then looked at how this affects the mud cover in the system. So I'm happy to uh, discuss this further. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Abby asks us, great talk. Did you find that tides impacted um, vegetation establishment? Yes, interesting. So um, this model has been uh, calibrated for um, boundary measurements. So the boundaries that we apply is, uh, is based on water level measurements. That means that there is also um, all tidal constituents and storm surges in the boundaries already. Um, but obviously, if, uh, if we would uh, choose boundaries that have a much stronger storm event, we probably get uh, um, temporarily less vegetation growth on, on some of the bars. Mm -hmm. um, Rose asks this question, she says, fantastic talk. Can you speak to what conservation implications are specific species better to work with for recovery in certain areas of the estuary more than others? I think that depends on the type of system. Um, so I think if we, um, we, if we con want to conserve a certain area with vegetation type, there's probably um, species that are more suitable than others. Um, ecologists might know more about this than me, but I guess that um, it's, it would be best to, to use species that are not um, annual, but perennial, so that live more than one year and that are probably also having a, a bigger appearance. So the, the morphology of the plant will be larger. So the eco-engineering effects can be larger than with a small species that might have difficulties to survive uh, sh certain stresses after um, a conservation project. Mm -hmm. um, there's, there's a few questions that are a little bit more technical. Um, so one question from Qin Rongzhu is, nice talk, do you, how do you determine the vegetation-induced drag coefficients uh, of different species in your research? So we have this, um, the equations I showed for the, for the roughness C and the drag coefficient account for the, for the height of the vegetation. And uh, DELF3D combines, ca calculates the C and the F for all species separately that we uh, implement in the model. And then every species will occur with a certain fraction in the cell. So maybe half of the cell is one species and the other half is the second one. Then the DELF3D will sum up the, the C and divide it by two. So basically it will um, calculate a mean value of the different roughness and drag force values per vegetation type. Mm -hmm. um, Benjamin is asking a more uh, uh, applied question again too. Like um, it's an ex excellent example of bridging, bridging models with ecological data is what he says. But then his question um, addresses as you mentioned, the Scheld River is heavily dredged. Could your work help to develop more sustainable dredging management? And what are the implications for flood contro control measurements? Um, I think uh, it might add a, a certain uh, stone to the big question. 
because I think that vegetation plays some uh, an, a, quite an important role in retaining sediment in the sedi in the system. So if we need to dredge, we and we have less sediment transport into the channel because of the vegetation, that will also reduce dredging uh, volume. Um, and the same for flood defense. If there's vegetation in the system, then of course this will uh, slow down velocities, but that can lead to higher water levels. So I think that um, vegetation needs to consider, be considered for this question anyways. How my work can contribute, I think that um, my model can predict vegetation establishment really well. So if we have an area where we want to see if vegetation will establish under certain conditions, then we could run scenarios to see um, if the vegetation establishment will also change flood risk or dredging volume. That would actually be really interesting to try that. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I'll, I'll, I'll give you like the last questions by Matt Kieron. Um, and he says, do non-mud dependent species also promote um, mud deposition? And if so, are they specifically promoting conditions that lead to their mortality and or replacement? Um, I'm not sure if I understood the question. So um, the mud dependent species grows on uh, muddy sediment. So by retaining mud in the system, it will actually facilitate its survival by the mud settling. So I'm not sure if I un understood the question correctly. Sorry, Matt. 